Good morning, everyone. We'll get started. Thank you for joining us today for our um, CBCS seminar. Today we've got Zoe Stone from Massey University. She's a postdoc research fellow over there. Um, now, some of you already know Zoe quite well. She did her PhD here under Martine um, uh, some years ago? A few years ago. Few years ago. <laughs> so as you can see, um, her talk today is about the inferences uh, from post-release monitoring of mainland reintroductions in New Zealand. And I understand that she's going to be um, talking a lot about the Totowai, the North Island Robin. So welcome, Zoe, and um, please get started. Thank you. Can't see with the mask on. Okay, I'm just going to wear a mask because I actually have field work to get back to in New Zealand four days time. So, just, so can you all hear me? Is that okay? Okay. Um, yeah. So thanks for that intro. Um, thanks for having me. Nice to be back um, after a while. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to talk a bit about what I've been up to in New Zealand for the last couple of years. Um, which is looking at post-release monitoring of a few different bird species in New Zealand. And this is work with Doug Armstrong and Kevin Parker at Massey University. Um, and it's part of a broader research project called More Birds in the Bush, which is a, a Manaki Whenua um, land care project where we're trying to collaborate all across the country about how we can do research to improve bird outcomes in New Zealand. So first off, I just want to say thank you to everybody who's involved in this project. We do a lot of field-based work, and so we have a lot of people involved, um, particularly the Taranaki Maunga project out there and Palmerston North City Council are the two sites that we work very closely with, um, Department of Conservation and, and Altitude, who are some collaborators, and Manaki Kinoa, who's got our big research um, group. Um, and I also want to just thank the, the iwi, um, the local Māori groups that we work with, particularly Nararu and um, Rangitane, who are the main um, iwi from the sites that we work at. So they let us work in these pretty cool places with some special birds. First off, um, uh, so I don't know if you know how much you know about New Zealand conservation, but we're pretty good at doing island conservation. So in the past, we have been able to get, we have quite a few little islands around our archipelago, and we've been able to eradicate pests, which are the main threat to most of our species. So things like rats and cats and stoats. We can eradicate them from islands. We put a lot of poison out, we get rid of things, and then we can put birds back and they do pretty well. And that's kind of how we've got our um, status as good conservation country. Um, but we're kind of getting to the stage now that we have to get, move beyond our islands. We've got a large mainland um, area. And so all these um, dots are kind of examples of most of the islands where we do work and a few of the eco centuries on the mainland. But these sort of points are basically point locations, most of those. Islands very small, only a few hundred hectare at the most. And so now we're starting to think about what do we do in these large landscapes where we can't necessarily eradicate everything um, and how do we manage those landscapes? So reintroductions on the mainland are now kind of increasing because of this lack of running out of islands and having to do something where in large scale where it actually can do something good. And um, campaigns like the Predator Free 2050, which is a huge national campaign to try and eradicate our main pest species, so the rats, um, stoats and possums from the entire country, uh, means that more habitats are becoming available. We've got a huge amount of programs across the country that are trying to increase pest, pest control on the mainland and we're getting these sites that might be safe enough for some of our birds to be reintroduced to. But the problem with um, moving on to the mainland is that these large areas are quite hard to manage until we can get to a predator-free um, environment you know this is a long-term ongoing management that we have to do as soon as you stop everything disappears again um, and so it's very hard and we have very complex topography in New Zealand lots of mountains hills and so it's pretty hard to manage these large areas and it's also got a greater potential for dispersal so you know most people think of connectivity as a great thing for conservation but in New Zealand when we're talking about reintroducing things especially when you've got a a threat that isn't completely eradicated over the mainland. If things can move out of your sanctuary, um, they get eaten. So we want to actually try and reduce dispersal in these scenarios when you're trying to set up populations. So that's a bit of a challenge, um, which is kind of where I come in. So this is just a summary of some of the work we've been working on, um, a review that we put together about bird movement in New Zealand. So what do we actually know about how far birds move in the forest? So these are all the forest 
bird species we have along here and we've got a bit of a, a log scale at the bottom and as you can see we don't actually know a lot about um, bird dispersal in New Zealand so this is our gap crossing ability so how far they can move between a, a fragment of forest and most of our species particularly our deep endemics so our really unique species that have been adapted to New Zealand so our kōkaka, our saddleback, our kiwi are up in this um, gap limited area so they can only cross gaps of about 200 meters, 500 meters at the most. So they're highly restricted when we get fragmented landscapes. We have some fairly good dispersers, our cuckoos and harriers and raptors and things, but though many of these species aren't our um, highly threatened species that we're actually managing. So when it comes to um, reintroductions, if we have an island or a fragmented eco sanctuary, these species do pretty well, but as soon as we get more um, connected habitat, we don't actually know how far they could go. So these are a couple of examples of sites that we've been working in in the past in New Zealand. So Tiriti Matangi is quite a famous island. If you've ever been to New Zealand, it's generally your bird spotting place. It's a small little island in Auckland. Um, it's only 200 hectares. And this is just a permeability um, map where we map the vegetation within two kilometers of the site. And it's an island with nothing around it. So things can't go anywhere. And of course, because of that, we've been able to reintroduce a lot of species to this island. Um, if you ever want to see a cool bird, you go to Turi, and that's your place to go. Whereas if we start moving into the mainland, so this is Hanua Ranges, also in Auckland, it's a bit of a larger site at 600 hectares where we have a intensely managed area within a highly connected forest area. And we've tried a couple of tree introductions there and they've all failed. So similar species to what we've done on Turi. So we know how to manage them, but they don't do well in connected landscapes. So how does this work in terms of dispersal? So here's our Hanua site as an example. So we've got our managed area in the middle with our surrounded forest matrix, which isn't managed, where all the rats hang out. And dispersal can impact our reintroductions in a few different ways. So first, if we release our individuals, so we've done some management at the site to reduce our threat. So we think we can put things back, if we do that. And then we get post release dispersal. So this is the first stage where dispersal comes into play for a reintroduction success. We'll have species moving around. They've just been put in a weird place and they want to see where they want to go. Um, and they move around and some of them might move outside of your protected area and we'll lose those from the individual from the population. Then we might get their general home range and territory movements while they're foraging, looking for mates, all that sort of stuff. And again, if they move outside of our nice safe spot, we lose them again. And then finally, if they manage to make it all through here, we get some juveniles and chicks starting to appear, but then they have a natal dispersal, which is often, as far as we know, one of the biggest dispersal events that they do. Um, and so we can lose a lot of individuals during this stage, and then we get not many birds actually establishing in that population. So this is an example of a failed reintroduction, which happened with Tortawai in the Hanuas. And so we want to see what can we actually do to improve this? Do we need bigger areas that we need to manage? Or is it the management itself? Maybe we're actually losing them from um, the rat predation rather than the dispersal. So we've been working in a couple of sites. So Taranaki Maunga is um, on the west coast of the North Island. And it's about a thousand hectares within the large national park. So this is the, the management area here. It's an A24 block. It's the largest um, block in the country that uses these self resetting rat traps and they're spaced every 50 meters in that 1000 hectare reserve. So it's pretty intensely managed um, and it's highly connected as you can see, it's just in a large bit of bush. Um, and they released uh, robins there in 2017 and 2018. And so we've been working with the rangers there that do um, annual monitoring um, using their data to predict population growth. And also we went out and did some uh, monitoring of juveniles there to see how they're doing. So that's an in-progress one, that although it's been a few years and it's starting to look like it might work. And then more recently, we introduced Totowai to Tūrutia Reserve, which is just outside of Palmerston North, where I'm based. So that's a, an hour or so north of Wellington in the lower region of the North Line. And this is an even bigger site. So this is about 2,000 hectares of the main water catchment of Palmerston North. So these two dams here are where all the water comes from. And because of that, it's uh, close to the um, public so it's quite a cool little place and the council's put a lot of effort over the last 20 years to managing the site 
Um, these are, this is the pest control that happens. So across the 2000 hectares, we have bait stations and um, trapping tunnels, um, trapping boxes. And then also we have extra bait stations across in a broader area, which is about 4,000 hectares in total that they manage. And every, each of those bait stations and um, traps are checked every month by a team of contractors. So it's quite a great effort that they're putting into. And so last year we managed to reintroduce Totowai to the site because their rat numbers were looking good. And this is just where we released them by the dam there. So that's a very new in progress one. So the idea is to try and see what's happening in these two sites, how those bigger um, connected landscapes influence how successful these reintroductions are. But first off, um, how do we actually monitor these large landscapes? A reason why we don't know a lot about dispersal is because we, it's very hard to monitor a 20 gram bird in a 2000 hectare piece of bush. Um, so especially when it's hilly and New Zealand weather and all that fun stuff. So we employed a, a drone um, to try and figure out if this would help us. Um, so we collaborated with Chris Muller, who's a PhD student at Massey University, who's developed this special software that we can fly on a drone. And this means we can fly over the habitat instead of have the crawl through it. And it can pick up transmitters from birds really accurately. So this is um, Tudatia Reserve where our, our robins are recently. And you can kind of see it's very hilly, very dense vegetation. So the traditional ground monitoring can be a bit of a pain. And this is just an example of how the drone works. So we can fly a nice little flight line grid search and you spread out your grid search based on the transmitter size. So de depending on how detectable it is, because we were using very small transmitters for robins, um, it had to be quite close together. But because of that, you can get very accurate um, signals. So this is a signal detection and this is what that um, data looks like. So what you get is this noise, which if you've done telemetry, and you hear the static on the radio, that's basically what that is. And then you get a little peak saying that you've got a signal. And so that peak was here and the bird was at the X. So you can get within 20 meters of the bird. So for telemetry work, it's pretty great when you can get that sort of accuracy. And so what we did is we combined this aerial with ground tracking. So we spent quite a lot of time on the ground. So we did 11 weeks of monitoring, which was what our transmitter batteries could cope with or lasted. And we, out of that, we got about 10 hours of aerial monitoring, which covered about 600 hectares of that reserve. And then we did ground tracking as well, which was 300 hours and covered the whole reserve. So the reserve, I'm not sure if you can see, but up here on the hill, it's pretty exposed and it's actually a wind farm that they're built constructing. So it's quite windy, which makes drones a little bit harder to use. Um, and because of that, we were also limited in our hours with weather and uh, visual line of sight. So part of the project was to see, you know, if we can, managers who aren't necessarily skilled pilots can use a system like this without having to be highly trained. And because of that, we stuck to the sort of the public um, rules around drone flying, which means you have to stay in line of sight and fly at certain times and altitudes, which restricts how much area you can actually cover, particularly in these very hilly areas where you happen to fly a drone into a tree just around the corner there. Um, so yeah, so we did that for 11 weeks and we managed to find um, over 300 detections of our 40 birds that we released. Um, and at least every bird was found once during that monitoring period. So that was really cool. Um, the last bird, the 40th bird was found during the breeding monitoring later. So that was really cool. Um, so we could actually track these small birds and many of them we got multiple locations of and as they started to settle and create territories. Um, from the drone, the drone was really great. Um, it wasn't as the bee's knees as we all hope drones are gonna be in conservation, but one, one of the great things about it is it was really useful when we started to get birds settling, we got hotspots and we had a vague idea of where they were. So you could fly the drone quickly over that area, get a detection and know the bird was there. When you're doing your blind searching, it was a bit harder because you were limited by where you could send the drone. So yeah, so it's kind of, you do need that combination of um, tracking to do these sort of complex monitoring sessions. And part of, um, we were able to, while we were doing all our drone flying, we did a kind of cool little side paper, just looking at the bird responses to 
drone activity. So there's a bit of um, interest about how wildlife are affected by drones. They make a lot of noise, disturb um, birds. But most of this work is done on sort of shorebirds and birds that are a little bit more spooked easily. So we took around 2,000 observations of 31 species in the reserve um, using our camera attached to the drone and looked at how the birds were reacting to the drone. And uh, great news is most of them didn't really care at all. Um, we got eight species that showed a obvious direct response to the drone and most of those were water birds. So the ducks and the fowls that were on the, on the lake. So for an example, here's a, here's a duck on the lake that as soon as the drone took off, it took off. But they generally responded in the same sort of way if a human was just walking around. So it was fairly minor. And that was good. And then we had kiriru, um, which is our pigeon, um, would sit in a perch in a tree and totally not fussed as the drone flew directly over them. Um, and they were even doing their display um, breeding flight um, patterns below the drone. And also we had, had a, um, a totoai nest that happened to be in our flight path. And so we stopped it directly over the, the nest as it was feeding chicks and it kept feeding, kept singing was totally not fussed by a drone that would have been about 10 meters away from it at that point. So that was really great. So yeah, if you want to use a drone for forest birds, generally in New Zealand anyway, it's pretty good. And then once we could actually track them, we wanted to know where they were going. So if you didn't know anything about robins, they generally like to go in the hardest to play, reach places in the middle of supple jack. So, um, but they also went to other places as well. Um, so we go back to our whole reserve here released 40 birds just by this dam. So we quite tried to do it um, on the eastern side of the dam because we thought that might help help keep kind of keep them in the middle. Um, but of course, birds do whatever they want. Um, so here is where we found birds over the 11 weeks. Um, and most of them did stay in the reserve. So because it was a large area, we, we could only monitor the reserve itself. But because we were finding the birds in the reserve, that was great news anyway. And in terms of how far they disperse, so we're talking about a sort of 800 hectares across the reserve that they covered after they were released, which if you think back to the Hinua Ranges, which was only 600 hectares and a failed reintroduction, that site was probably nowhere near big enough to incorporate that dispersal movement. An interesting thing that we can kind of use from this is when we would go back to the um, birds in the breeding season. So we released them in April, monitor them for 11 weeks, leave them alone and then come back in September when they start breeding and see where they are. So in September, we had about um, half the birds had settled in territories. We had about 10 um, breeding pairs. Luckily, they all decided to hang out by the dams, which is a very easy access for us, which was very, very nice of them. Um, but if you look at that, it's only about 200 hectares that they're following. So most post-release monitoring in New Zealand generally does rely on just breeding monitoring. So they'll release birds. They don't have the resources or all capability to do the intensive monitoring. They'll come back in the breeding season, see what's happening. So if you were um, managing your reserve based on the information that you got from the breeding season, you would think they might have only gone 200 hectares or something, but it's a much different story if you actually know where they're going day to day. Yeah, so that was our post-release monitoring, um, post-release dispersal. And then in Tararaki Maunga, we were really interested in looking at that natal dispersal. So there's very little information in New Zealand on any species about juvenile dispersal. And because it's generally quite big um, and juveniles are small, so they're very hard to track. So we tried to do this at Taranaki. Um, this is Taranaki Maunga behind us. Um, and in 2020 and 2021, we tagged a whole bunch of juveniles um, and looked at where they went. So it's quite a tough site, Taranaki, as I've learned. Since. So we, over about four months, we only managed to ban 20 birds um, and we tracked eight of them with transmitters um, and only three of them were found within the block. And one was found by a ranger outside of the block as well. So it was, we got a little bit of information. The three that were tracked inside the block didn't move too far. They were kind of in the range that we were thinking, um, but some of them can go far. We know that a juvenile has been detected at a site about 10 kilometers away. And as you can see, Taranaki has all these nice little corridors that lead out of the um, park. So they are capable of moving quite long distances. But um, yeah, this is kind of still a work in progress. Um, hopefully we'll get some, we've 
been working with the rangers to continue tagging their juveniles as that population is growing so we can hopefully get a bit more information about how that population spreads. One interesting thing is we've been using all the four years of um, breeding data and all the birds are found on this lower slopes of the mountain um, and it's about a 600 meter elevation which um, is about this line here. Um, so they're on the lower slopes and so in terms of management if this if this block was solely um, created for robin um, management we've got a whole area that's been wasted basically so we're talking with them about possibly um, rearranging their reserve so you could put some on the edges particularly at the bottom and on these sides where we're getting birds dispersing which won't be getting that protection and just an example of why it's a bit hard to track birds this is a this is a good day on the mountain this is after a bad day on the mountain um, yeah it's a, quite a challenging and it rains half the time um, so yeah we would try to use the drone here as well but because we're on the lower slopes as you can see you don't really get good vantage points at all um, so for the rangers that work there I give them huge props um, yeah and then okay so we're not kind of getting a sense of where they're going um, but how are they actually doing in these sites so we're kind of getting back to the management effectiveness in the sites so um, at Tiritia, as we do with most of our introductions, we created some prior models of what we expected the population to do. And this is based on data um, work done by Doug Armstrong and Liz Pilato, where they created a sort of Bayesian framework for population modeling that they keep updating every time they have a new um, reintroduction and they can update with site information and breeding success. And based on what we thought the site was at um, Tiritia, we expected a um, population growth to occur so this is our lambda which is our rate of increase and any uh, anything for population you want it greater than one if it's greater than one you have a growing population if it's less than one you have a declining population so our models predicted we would have a slightly growing population and our number of females would also be increasing over time so that's why we put the birds there we thought they would do okay based on what we knew but might not be as simple so we have Tara, who is our amazing master's student, has been out there monitoring the breeding success of birds for the last few months um, to see actually how they're doing and if they meet these models. So these are our 10 um, breeding pairs that we had at the start of the season, um, all spread around the dams. And this is what we got at the end of the breeding season. So we lost quite a few individuals. Um, we were left with two pairs and a few individuals hanging around and we'd lost quite a few. This is an encounter um, history of all the birds that we're monitoring. And as you can, basically what I want you to see here is just the highlight bits of zeros. So we went back and checked those nets regularly. And as soon as we started not getting them to um, showing up for multiple times, we could kind of assume that they had died. Um, so these birds are quite highly territorial. So we should, we should be able to go back and see them if they're still there. So is this kind of dispersal happening or is there something with the management that we're, we're not um, doing properly? So as with anything in New Zealand, we go back to our old rats. So we put out some camera traps to tra on nests to see what was actually happening. And it appeared that the rats were eating our chicks and our females. And we get a few gruesome pictures like that happening. <laughs> so yeah, so, you know, in terms of our size of management, um, as our, 1,000, 2,000 hectares is plenty for the dispersal of the species, but can we actually manage those sites to the degree that's needed? So after our breeding season, we updated our models um, and under the rat tracking, which is 19%. So rat tracking is a measure of abundance that we use in New Zealand, which is based on tracking tunnels with uh, ink cards. So you can see the footprints is rat tracked through and depending on how many tracks you put out and how many, um, how many traps have uh, rats sign that gives you a percentage of the tracking rate so if you had 100 tunnels out and 19 of them had footprints you have a 19 percent so in New Zealand we try to get down to about five percent that's kind of what most of our birds like um, robins aren't quite as sensitive because they don't nest in hollows so they can kind of cope a little bit more with rats but so it's a bit higher than what we'd like and with our new breeding um, data we got a new um, model for our population growth which is just under one so not a great start for this new population 
and also our female um, numbers were also declining as well. So again, when you have a tiny, small establishing populations, we kind of need females. And if we um, updated our model to increase our predicative control, um, so get to that magic 5% number, our models were still predicting quite a low um, population growth, only maybe only just getting to 1%. So interesting times, we're at the point where we're gonna come back in the next season and see how many birds survived the year, how many birds we're still getting, whether we would do a follow-up um, range. Because if, if we can kind of get that rat tracking better, and they all survived, we might be able to put birds back and kind of boost it up, which is a bit like what they did at Taranaki. So it could work. And the council is really um, on board with this project. So as soon as we showed them these models, they said, okay, tell us where to put traps. We'll put traps out. So we're also going to try a little bit of an adaptive management approach to try and get a bit of a core area around where those territories are, boost up the bait stations and traps and see if that impacts. Because there's also this idea as we manage larger areas in New Zealand, can we have these small core areas of management in the wider landscape and that be effective? So we'll kind of test that out as well. So yeah, so what have we learned from all of this? Um, smaller sites, I mean, smaller on a New Zealand scale, not Australian scale, but um, 600 hectares, probably not big enough for birds to disperse in, um, to capture dispersing. So if you want to actually reintroduce these birds to these connected sites, you need to go bigger. But bigger is quite complicated. We need to make sure our management is actually covering that whole area. And for Tudatea, um, you know, the, it looks like fairly good coverage, but there's areas where you might have 500 meters or so without any rat um, control. So you need to make sure you have the capability to do quite intensive management. Monitoring is quite difficult, but it can be done. Um, so if you want to find out this information, you can actually employ a bit of a combination of survey techniques um, and the technology for transmitters and stuff is available these days for very small birds as well. And so for reintroductions, dispersal is still quite an important part um, and you need to kind of consider at the various different stages um, for a species like tortoise that can cope during the year because it's not roosting in hollows you might only need to be considering it during the breeding season, but other species like uh, tiaki, saddleback or kulkako, which are more sensitive throughout the year, you're gonna have to think about dispersal in a bit bigger scale. And what's next? So now that we've got all our sort of field season out of the way, uh, we were a bit delayed by COVID, but everybody was. Um, we're, I'm currently working on a bit of a habitat suitability model um, for both sites where we're trying to see what um, territories were in certain places. So for Taranaki, for example, why are they only in that lower area? Is it just an elevational thing? Or as you can see, there's a lot of birds going in a straight line and that's along a river course. So there's some certain environmental um, reasons why they might settle in places, which will help us uh, figure out where they might disperse as well. We're also creating the population dispersal model. So trying to use those three different dispersal uh, um, data and try and figure out how a population grows once we reintroduce them at those different stages so we can get like overall um, information on that. And then we've got a couple more reintroductions in the way. So we were working on a purple cartier, which is a white head um, reintroduction, which I'm worth doing three days after I get back. So hope I don't get sick. Um, and this is a small site that we're taking them to Bushy Park, but it is quite a connected site. It's got a lot of little fragments around it. And a purple cartier has a little bit of a better gap crossing ability, it's about 500 meters, whereas the robin was at about 100 meters. So it could disperse quite a bit in that landscape. So we're gonna kind of see what happens there. And yeah, I think that's, yes, thank you. <laughs>